Hello everyone, welcome back. Last time we looked at the saving investment identity for a closed economy and an open economy. And the main idea was that for either case, overall savings must equal your domestic investment by firms. Now, today we're going to look at the same relationship, but now in terms of a model for a market for loanable funds. Now, these loanable funds are your financial capital. This financial capital will be channeled from savers in the economy to borrowers in our economy. Once borrowers use this financial capital in order to purchase new physical capital stock we will refer to that as our investment spending for that particular time period now in order to make sure you understand the distinction between financial capital and different types of capital let's just quickly look at the three types of capital that we have the first one is your physical capital stock we have talked about this a lot now this is when your businesses spend money on machinery equipment the factories software any type of new physical capital stock then you have your human capital human capital refers to the improvement in your labor force it can be generated by education knowledge vocational training or different techniques of developing the skill set of your labor force then we have your financial capital Capital, which is our main concern for this chapter these are the funds which are being channeled from savers in our economy to the borrowers in our economy and borrowers primarily firms will use these funds in order to purchase new physical capital stock which we refer to as our investment spending for that given time period now having said that let's go back to the market for loanable funds and see what this market is like any market the market for loanable funds is a platform where two different type of buyers and sellers will interact with each other these buyers and sellers are now selling loanable funds or renting loanable funds so we refer to them as our lenders and borrowers of our economy now this loanable funds market remember is a hypothetical market in actual fact there are many different type of financial instruments that are being traded through which funds are transferred from savers to borrowers so for example we'll have a different type of market for corporate bonds and a different type of market for stocks likewise we'll have a different market for funds when they're being exchanged for mortgages because the overall behavior remains the same we can bring all of these different markets under the same umbrella and refer to it as our loanable funds market so just like for any other market we will have a demand for funds in this market generated by the borrowers then we will have a supply of funds provided by the lenders interest rate is the price of funds interest rate is the price of funds that are being exchanged in this market interest rate is the rental cost of funds calculated as a percentage of the principal amount borrowed so for example if i'm borrowing hundred dollars from you and the rental cost is ten dollars and I promise to pay you back this amount plus the cost after one year the principal amount over here is hundred and the rental cost is ten and that gives us our interest rate of ten percent interest rate remember is the cost of borrowing so for a borrower he or she has to pay this interest once the loan matures and for the lender interest is the payoff or the benefit for lending out these funds today and receiving them in one year the quantity demanded for loanable funds at any given interest rate will largely depend upon also the projected rate of return on the project rate of return on a project is simply the profit earned on the project as a percentage of its cost so for example I am thinking of borrowing hundred dollars in order to pursue some investment opportunity and this prospective investment opportunity is giving me a specific rate of return now over here you can see this is my revenue from my project the overall costs of the project as a percentage of the cost of the project so this term over here is simply the profit that I'm expecting to get. Whatever is the prevailing interest rate, I have to compare my expected rate of return to this cost of borrowing. I will only be willing to borrow funds if the rate of return on the project is higher than or equal to my cost of borrowing, which is our nominal interest rate at which I will be borrowing funds in order to pursue this particular project. If the rate of return on the project is lower than my cost of borrowing, I will not borrow money and therefore not pursue this investment opportunity because my rate of return is not even covering my costs that I have to pay in order to get this financing. I will only pursue projects for which rate of return is higher than or at least covering my borrowing cost. The demand curve for our loanable funds is therefore downward sloping. As you can see, the higher the interest rate, there are less projects which are profitable at such a higher interest rate. So very few projects, let's say, who have a rate of return higher than or equal to 12%. Therefore, quantity demanded at point A is considerably lower than the quantity demanded for loanable funds at point B, 
where the corresponding interest rate is now a lot lower. At the lower interest rate, there are many more projects which are now profitable and hence the quantity demanded for loanable funds increases. So higher the interest rate, lower is the quantity demanded for loanable funds. Lower the interest rate, higher is the quantity demanded for loanable funds. And this gives us our downward sloping demand curve for loanable funds, holding everything else constant. The supply of loanable funds is giving us the relationship between quantity supplied and nominal interest rate. Interest rate for savers or lenders is the benefit that they're going to receive in the future. So higher the interest rate, higher is the payoff from lending or higher is the benefit that they will receive. Hence, quantity supplied of loanable funds is also correspondingly higher. Remember that the supply of loanable funds in our domestic market is representing supply coming from both households and from government. So this supply is capturing both our private and our public savings and it's private savings which are largely responding to interest rate movements bringing the two together the equilibrium interest rate is i star where your quantity supplied exactly equals our quantity demanded note that at this equilibrium interest rate of eight percent only projects which are profitable at eight percent are going to be funded and for all of these projects for which eight percent cost of borrowing is not sufficient these projects will not be funded these projects are not profitable at this given interest rate. Also note that at 8% interest rate, offers from only those savers or lenders are going to be accepted who are willing to lend at an interest rate of 8%. All those savers and lenders who demand an interest rate higher than 8%, they will not end up getting any demand for their funds. So this is not only just an equilibrium outcome, but this is also an efficient outcome of our market. Just like any market diagram, whenever the interest rate will be higher than the equilibrium interest rate, so let's say at 12%, we have an excess supply of funds. Quantity supplied is much higher than quantity demanded. And this surplus of funds will push the interest rate down and we'll move towards our equilibrium interest rate. Movement along the two curves, till the quantity demanded again equals quantity supplied. Likewise, if the interest rate is lower than our equilibrium interest rate of 8%, so let's say it's at 4, in this case, we have an excess demand for funds. Too many borrowers willing to borrow funds at the lower cost of borrowing, but not enough sellers willing to lend their funds at the lower interest rate. This shortage in the market will push the interest rate up, and as the interest rate is pushed up, the shortage will be eliminated, and we move back along the two curves back to our equilibrium. So so at equilibrium, we again have $30 billion of funds being exchanged. There are no borrowers at this interest rate who want funds and not receiving those funds. Likewise, there are no sellers at this 8% interest rate who want to lend at the 8% and are not getting any borrowers for their funds. Every saver finds a borrower and every borrower finds a saver. So for given demand and supply curves, we know that interest rates will always converge towards the equilibrium interest rate. However, in real life, we know that interest rates are not always the same. They're not always converging to some equilibrium, but in fact, they fluctuate a lot. So it might be so that they're actually moving from one equilibrium to another. So let's now see what are the reasons for this volatility in interest rates. Some fluctuation in interest rates can be coming from the demand side. The first one I have over here is our changes in perceived business opportunities. So this is looking at what businesses expect about the future in terms of their profitability or in terms of the state of the economy. So so for example, let's say businesses expect that their profit margins are going to decline over the next decade. With this declining profitability, businesses are going to reduce their demand for funds at any given interest rate. So the demand curve for loanable funds decreases and shifts to the left. With the lower demand, you can see that the equilibrium interest rate is pushed down. As interest rate goes down, households are not willing to lend as much as before and therefore quantity supplied of loanable funds goes down. And overall, you can see our equilibrium interest rate is lower and so is our equilibrium quantity of funds being exchanged. Remember that these funds are going to be used to pursue investment opportunities. So we can say that in this economy, both saving and investment will be reduced because of the decrease in demand for loanable funds. My second shifter over here is coming from changes in government policies that affect investment. So in this case, businesses will have to give a larger share of their revenues to the government in the form of taxes. This is obviously going to again decrease our demand for loanable funds. Businesses will be discouraged to pursue further investment opportunities in this economy. And with the lower demand, again, interest rate is pushed down. Quantity supply decreases in response to that and overall equilibrium interest rate and equilibrium quantity of funds exchanged is lower.
On the supply side, we can likewise look at different factors that will affect the supply curve for loanable funds. Remember, supply is coming from savers. Savers can be both your households or coming from the government in terms of public savings. Any changes in the behavior of households in terms of their consumption spending will also automatically lead to changing in their saving behavior. Recall that private savings are simply equal to our disposable income minus consumption. So anything that causes household to consume more will actually reduce savings. Any Anything that increases household overall income, holding everything else constant, will increase private savings. In my example over here, I have higher home prices in Canada, which are making people feel richer. As people feel richer with the same income, they are now spending more and therefore saving less. With this reduction in saving, it's your supply curve of loanable funds which will decrease and shift to the left. And as the supply curve decreases at our initial interest rate, we have a shortage in the market. This shortage pushes the interest rate up. And at the higher interest rate, because this is our cost of borrowing, firms are not willing to borrow as much funds as before. And that decreases your quantity demanded of loanable funds. And therefore, we have overall a higher equilibrium interest rate accompanied by a decrease in quantity of funds exchanged. Just like last time, again, note that this quantity of funds exchanged is going to pursue your investment opportunities. So if overall savings have reduced, investment and saving are both now lower at this higher equilibrium interest rate. The second main reason for shift in the supply curve comes from our public savings. So public savings, remember, are generated through budget surpluses. Whenever the government runs a surplus, public savings are positive. Whenever government runs a deficit, public savings are negative. Let's assume the government runs a deficit. So that causes our overall domestic savings to go down because if private savings are still the same, public savings are now a negative number because our overall domestic or national savings to decrease at any given interest rate. So a deficit will cause your supply curve of loanable funds, which is made up of both of these type of domestic savings, to decrease and shift to the left. As the supply curve decreases, it again pushes the interest rate up as this higher interest rate quantity demanded of loanable funds by firms is reduced. This reduction in quantity demanded because of the government running a budget deficit is called crowding out of private investment. Note that at this new equilibrium, quantity of funds exchanged is now much lower than before. So overall, both saving and investment have reduced in this economy. Crowding out can be a huge concern if governments keep on running consecutive deficits. However, for economies which are already in the middle of a big recession, increased government spending actually helps the economy in coming out of that recession. It creates more jobs, it creates higher income for households, and pushes our GDP and economic growth in the right direction. Fluctuations in interest rates can therefore be linked to either shifts in demand or supply of the loanable funds. Remember that changes in government policy can not only just affect the demand side as we saw earlier, some government policies can also affect the supply side. For example, if we have increases in taxes for interest income. Interest income, remember, is earned by savers. Savers in this case will have an incentive to reduce their overall savings and therefore we'll see supply of loanable funds decreasing causing the interest rate to go up. We can also see technological innovations happening in the economy. Technological innovations typically cause demand for loanable funds to increase because as firms want to adopt this new technology, they will be looking for external financing and overall demand for loanable funds will increase. Lastly, we have the relationship between inflation and interest rates. As we saw in Chapter 8, unexpected inflation can have a huge impact on both lenders and borrowers of our economy. And in the case for market for loanable funds, we'll see that both demand and supply curve will be affected. In order to see how it is affected, let's recall our Fisher equation. Fisher equation was simply stating that nominal interest rates are real interest rates with some expectation of inflation. We can also rewrite this equation as real interest rate equals nominal minus inflation rate. What this is telling us is that when contracts are written, even though they are in nominal terms, they have some expectation of inflation in them. According to the Fisher equation, if we expect higher expectations of inflation, nominal interest rates will be driven up. If we expect inflation to go down, nominal interest rates will be going down. Let's see if the demand and supply framework for the loanable funds market gives us the same result. In order to see that, remind yourself how will higher expectation affect you as a lender and how will higher expected inflation affect you as a borrower. Recall that whenever inflation goes up, holding everything else constant, it causes our real interest rate to go down. And real interest rate is the payoff to lender, so the lender is actually worse off.
for the borrower the real interest rate is the real cost of borrowing holding everything else constant nominal interest rate is not changing higher inflation causes again the real interest rate to go down and making our borrower better off so in terms of the supply of loanable funds at any given nominal interest rate higher inflation is causing the real interest rate to go down making lenders worse off and supply of loanable funds will decrease on the other side of the market higher inflation is causing real interest rate to go down real cost of borrowing is going down and therefore causing demand for loanable funds to increase quantity demanded of loanable funds increases at any given nominal interest rate so both supply and demand curve are shifting supply will be shifting to the left it's decreasing and demand will increase to the right and as you can see with the increase in demand and decrease in supply we have a higher nominal interest rate so the fisher effect has been proven by our demand supply framework also that whenever we have inflation rising it causes the nominal interest rate also to increase by the exact same amount leaving our real interest rate overall unchanged and in this particular case our initial expectation of inflation was that it's zero with the higher expectation of inflation at 10 percent nominal interest rate has also increased by 10 percent so for every one percentage change in inflation nominal interest rate also changes by 1%. If both are changing at the same rate, real interest rate actually remains unchanged. So our demand supply analysis very nicely confirms the Fisher effect. Nominal interest rates always move in the same direction as our expectations of inflation. If inflation is expected to go up, nominal interest rates will also rise by the same amount. If inflation is going down, nominal interest rates will also move in the same direction and by the exact same amount leaving our real interest rates unchanged in the long run next we look at the global loanable funds market now we're going to expand our analysis to include the effect of global capital flows across different economy in order to do this analysis we're going to assume that there are no restrictions on capital flows so capital flows freely across different economies. the main determinant that affects capital flow is the return that the capital receives so whichever economy is given giving us a higher interest rate, capital will be attracted to that economy. In this diagram over here, we have two loanable funds markets, one for Canada and one for Britain. Each market has its own demand and its own supply. Demand is coming from domestic residents of each economy and supply of loanable funds in each economy comes from their private households and their public savings. In this case, we are starting with the initial interest rate in Canada at a much higher level compared to the interest rate in Britain. Now, once global capital flows freely across the two economies we know capital is attracted to the higher interest rate so savers in britain would much rather save in canada and therefore we see capital inflow for canada and on the other side we'll see capital outflow we saw in our saving investment identity for an open economy that capital inflow increases their overall savings and with higher savings the supply curve is shifting to the right and it pushes their interest rate down so the new interest rate in canada will be a lot lower than their initial interest rate. For Britain, capital outflow, remember, reduces your overall savings because some of your national savings or domestic savings are flowing out to the rest of the world. In our demand supply diagram, we know it will push the interest rate in Britain up. So the domestic market for loanable funds in Britain sees a higher interest rate. As these interest rates are moving, you can see in opposite direction, they are actually converging towards each other. So in the long run, interest rate in Canada is going down, interest rate in Britain is going up, and they will eventually be exactly equal to each other. On my next diagram, we have shown to be exactly equal at 4%. So we started at 6% in Canada, but we have eventually reached to 4%. And in Britain, we had started from 2%, and we have reached to 4%. At this 4% equilibrium world interest rate, in the domestic market, we do not have equilibrium. In the two respective domestic markets, you can see the given their respective demand and supply curves, we have actually a shortage or a surplus. In Canada, at the world equilibrium interest rate, we have a shortage of funds. And this shortage is met by the capital inflow that they're receiving from the rest of the world. In Britain, at the higher world interest rate, the domestic market is actually seeing a surplus of funds. Quantity supplied in the domestic market exceeds their quantity demanded. And what are they doing with the surplus? 
they are sending it abroad in terms of capital outflow. Remember, an economy that receives capital inflow becomes the net borrower. And the economy that sees capital outflow ends up becoming the net lender. So in the long run, capital flows not only cause the interest rates to equalize across the two countries, but they also end up making one country a net borrower and the other country a net lender. That brings us to the end of chapter 10. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I will see you guys next time.